Central Texas, 1875. A young cowboy lopes his mount through the sagebrush and mesquite, admiring the plentiful blue bonnets and enjoying the last vestiges of the cool mid-May morning before the substantial heat of the afternoon sets in. The young man's name is James Buchanan Gillette. Known to his friends as Jim, he had been born and raised in Austin, Texas, and spent much of his 18 years supplementing his family's income by hunting, fishing, and working as a ranch hand. In the previous few years, he had worked for a number of outfits in and around the Austin area. Despite his youth, he had managed to build a solid reputation as a knowledgeable, fastidious, and reliable hand. In early March of 1876, he had come here to Menardville, present-day Menard, Texas, situated on the banks of the San Saba River, roughly 140 miles northwest of his hometown. Here, Gillette had found employment working for a local rancher named Wes Ellis. Ellis offered food, board, and $30 pay a month, a working situation that most employers in the area at the time would be hard-pressed to match. For a young man who loved the outdoors, possessed the requisite skills in horsemanship and ranch work, and had a healthy thirst for danger, life did not get much better, a fact that was not at all lost on Gillette. He loved the freedom and adventure of life as a working cowboy, despite its incessant hardships and unyielding chore list. But as much as he loved the outdoors, Gillette, like all young men, appreciated a reprieve from his labors. Every week or so, he would head into Menardville to collect his mail, procure some groceries, and visit with friends. On one of these trips, he had met and become friends with a company of Texas Rangers. The Rangers were situated in a camp nearby and also received their mail in Menardville, though by the 1870s the lore of the Texas Rangers was known nationwide and even worldwide. This was Jim Gillette's first personal encounter with the vaunted mounted gunmen whose violent encounters in locales from Mexico to the Red River had become the stuff of legend. The young man became understandably enthralled with Rangers' accounts of life in the field. Their accounts of trailing criminals and avenging raids on frontier homesteads were more than sufficient enticement for Gillette to inquire as to how he might come to join their ranks. As luck would have it, in the spring of 1875, the state of Texas had authorized the company commander, Captain Dan W. Roberts, to add 20 men to his roster. The official date for the opening of enlistment applications had been set for June 1st. With time to kill until then, Gillette was on his way to visit a group of cowboy friends who were camped along the San Saba River not far from Menardville. Upon regaling them with his plans to enlist with the rangers in a few weeks, one of the young cowboys, a young man named Norbin Rogers, volunteered to go along with him to Menardville in hopes of securing a position with the rangers. The two young men made their way to Menardville, where they were informed that Captain Roberts had come to the area early and was settling in with the rest of the company in the rangers' campsite. Loath to wait two more weeks for their opportunity, the pair rode out to introduce themselves to Captain Roberts and to apply for positions with the ranger company. Just before reaching the rangers' campsite, Neil Rogers pulled his horse up close to Gillette's and beseeched him in hushed tones to do the talking for both of them. His assumption that Gillette possessed at least enough foreknowledge to comport himself reputably amongst the camp of seasoned veterans was, to put it mildly, wildly misguided. But having little other recourse than to agree, Gillette acquiesced. Soon, both young prospects were standing in front of the tent of Captain Roberts as the captain came out to greet them. Captain Roberts was a man of about 35 years old, tall and lean, well-liked and respected by his men, and possessive of a knowledge and intuition gained only through years of experience in the unremitting, unforgiving world of the Texas frontier. Captain Roberts greeted his obviously self-conscious young visitors and inquired as to the nature of their visit. Mustering up as much confidence as he could bring to bear, Gillette informed the captain that he and his friend were bound and determined to join the ranks of the vaunted horse-bound gunmen. Captain Roberts examined the pair momentarily before thoughtfully inquiring, Did you say your name was Gillette? Young Jim confirmed that indeed it was. Are you a son of James S. Gillette, who was Adjutant General under Governor Sam Houston? Gillette affirmed that indeed this was his father. I have often heard my father, Buck Roberts, speak of your father, the captain recalled cheerfully. He then inquired as to the quality of the horses in the young prospect's possession. 
due to the demanding nature of ranger work, largely comprised of long-distance travel at rapid paces in unforgiving conditions. The specifications for the horses deemed acceptable for use as ranger mounts were both numerous and quite discriminatory. A ranger might be in the field for a month or more at a time and could only bring one horse. This required an animal that could be ridden hard for days on end on suboptimal feed with minimal water. When the young Gillette informed Captain Rogers that he and his friends were in possession of two mare ponies apiece, the captain could not stifle his involuntary chuckle at the young men's naivety. Young men were informed that their mares were not allowed in ranger ranks and they would have to return to town to procure more fitting mounts for the line of employment they were seeking. The pair of prospects hurriedly returned to Menardville where they were each able to procure suitable mounts. Riding back to the ranger camp, the captain informed them that their mounts were indeed sufficient to any prospective ranger task. They were told to return on June 1st to be sworn into their new positions. At 10 o'clock in the morning on that day, Jim Gillette, his friend Norman Rogers, and 18 other Texan men from a variety of backgrounds and a variety of ages were formed into a line and formally enlisted as members of Texas's most famous and infamous law enforcement group. Immediately upon their swearing in, all 50 of the rangers of Company D were divided into messes, 10 men to each mess. Each group of 10 was then issued 10 days worth of supplies, beans, bacon, coffee, sugar, rice, pepper, flour, and salt were all stapled foodstuffs. Each recruit was issued one 50 caliber Sharps carbine and one 45 caliber Colt pistol. The cost of each would be deducted from the ranger's first paycheck. Ironically, much of the burden of the rations, tent poles, canvas, cookware, and other sundries not carried on the person of the new recruits would be borne by one of the longest serving veterans of Company D, Ginny the Pack Mule. For years now, Ginny had hauled the supplies of her ranger masters all over Central and West Texas. She had endured brutally hot days, ruthlessly cold nights, and countless skirmishes and pursuits. Truth be told, she was but a singular member of an oft unheralded species that has played an incalculably significant role in Western history. The mule. The result of the crossbreeding of a male donkey with a female horse, the mule traces its origins to Western Asia roughly 3,000 years ago. A painting adorning the tomb of Nebamun in Thebes, which dates to approximately 1350 BC, shows a chariot being drawn by a pair of animals which many experts have discerned to be mules. Depictions of mules can be found in Mesopotamian artwork dating back to the first millennium BC, and their arrival in Asia Minor was even mentioned by Homer in the Iliad, dated 800 BC. Christopher Columbus brought mules to the New World in the 1490s. George Washington was known to champion their virtues, and by the mid-19th century, they were used extensively as both draft animals on farms and as pack animals for soldiers and frontiersmen alike. Male mules, known as horse mules or john mules, are larger than their female counterparts, though both are usually sterile. Both males and females can be distinguished from their horse and donkey parents by their longer ears, thick heads, thin limbs, small, narrow hooves with the short mane of its donkey father, and the long flowing tail of its mare mother. They tend to be closer in size to horses, with coat colors ranging any number of colors that can be found in both horses and donkeys. Like their donkey counterparts, many mules have paler patches around their bellies, on the insides of their thighs, and on their muzzles and around their eyes, along with what are known as primitive markings such as a dorsal stripe or a shoulder stripe. In addition to their sure-footedness, toughness, endurance, speed, and agility, mules exhibit a characteristic known as hybrid vigor. This, in short, means that mules are more than merely a sum of the genetic components of their parents, but possess a greater intelligence, memory, social affection, and, most famously, obstinance than either of their genetic predecessors. Though comparing the merits of horses versus mules can fast become a divisive subject in equine circles even today, Mules were as essential to the functioning of the rangers as were their more heralded mounts. For Ginny the pack mule, though, and for the rest of Company D, the bulk of the months that immediately followed the enlistment of the new recruits would see little of the hard riding and hard fighting that the rangers were so famous for. 
Instead, Gillette and his cohorts spent the time practicing writing and shooting, honing the skills of their trade in preparation for the eventuality that was violence and lawlessness in 1870s Texas. The primary threat amongst the plethora of threats facing any Texas farmer or rancher at the time was that of raiding from any of the hostile tribes in the area. The Kickapoos, the Kiowa, the Lipan Apache, and the Comanche had spent the preceding years exacting all the retribution they could on the Texas interlopers trespassing on their lands. Raiding was most common on full moon nights, so common that full moons in Texas are still often referred to as Comanche moons. Raiding parties could strike from bases hundreds of miles away from their intended targets, striking quickly and disappearing into the vast expanses of the plains. To thwart their efforts, Captain Robertson employed a number of native spies whom he stationed at every significant headwater, river crossing, and water hole in the territory as a means of intercepting any prospective raiding parties who would, at some point, need to water themselves and their mounts. When a raiding party was spotted, the spy, often from a native tribe on good terms with the Texans such as the Tonkawa, would make a mad dash to the nearest fort to report it to the rangers as soon as possible. In late 1875, Ranger Lim Syker had been detached to Fort Mason in order to procure supplies for Company D. Just as Syker had settled down in the lobby of the Frontier Hotel, a runner came rushing in announcing that a raiding party had stolen a herd of horses from local rancher John Gamble. Syker, being deprived of his after-dinner repose, immediately settled his horse, Old Pete, and embarked on an all-night ride back to the ranger encampment outside Menardville to alert the rest of the company. At about 8 o'clock the following morning, Syker and Old Pete made their way into the camp, alerting Captain Roberts and the rest of the men as to the situation at hand. The ranger's horses had been turned out to graze for the day, and as they were being rounded up, Captain Roberts appointed 15 men to go in pursuit of the band of raiders. Among those selected was Gillette, who, like the rest of his detail, was issued 100 rounds of ammunition and 10 days rations. Jenny the pack mule was loaded with the extra supplies and ammunition, and the contingent made as much haste as possible in making themselves ready to hit the trail. By noon, Captain Roberts was at the head of their single file line, leading them north to where the San Saba River crossed Scout Creek in what is today northeastern Menard County. Roberts had spent nearly two decades of his life in the Rangers up until now, and in that time had acquired the acuity and intuition born only of experience. He believed the raiding party to be heading north towards the open prairie. Roberts also knew the raiding party would be moving at a pace unknown to all but the most hardened pursuers over rough, unforgiving country. This dampened his hopes of actually catching and engaging them, much less returning the horses to their rightful owner. However, he did not feel the task to be outright impossible, and thus the rangers picked up their pace in hot pursuit. They crossed the San Saba River just north of Menardville then turned north as their trackers discerned the trail left by the raiding party. The standard ranger practice, employed here by Captain Roberts, was to detail their two best trackers to ride roughly 200 yards in front of the main body of rangers as the main body provided security. At roughly 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the party came upon a lone horse that had fallen behind and been left by the raiding party. The unfortunate animal had been cut by a lance and was nursing a lame rear leg. Captain Roberts discerned the animal to have been left by the raiding party at around sunrise that morning as the animal's coat had a film of sweat that had dried in the intervening hours. The captain estimated the raiding party, whose tribal identity was still unclear, to be 35 to 40 miles ahead of them. Such a gap, the experienced leader knew, could only be covered in such rough country via a steady, dogged pace. They would, he said, either walk down their quarry or not find them at all. The party kept to the trail at their belabored pace, taking no time to stop for dinner. After covering an estimated 60 miles, reaching the famed Kickapoo Springs well after sunset, the party made their camp and watered themselves and their horses for the first time since crossing the San Saba River that morning. The next morning, they headed out again, this time turning southwest. After seeing no trace of the raiding party for the bulk of the day, many of the rangers became nervous that they had lost the trail altogether. The experienced captain chuckled at their doubt and again proved himself a prudential leader when the trail reappeared that afternoon. However, even the captain was in for a rude surprise the next morning. Upon going out to retrieve their mounts, the rangers discovered that they had camped smack dab in the middle of a bed of rattlesnakes 
who were now out warming themselves in the summer sun. Two of the ranger's horses, one belonging to Jim Day and the other belonging to the captain himself, had been bitten during the night. Jim Day's horse's head had swollen to twice its normal size, and the captain's horse, known as Old Rock, had been bitten in the lower front leg. Two rangers were detailed to stay back with the injured horses until they either succumbed to their injuries or recovered sufficiently to carry on. As fate would have it, both animals would make a full recovery. Their relegations to the sideline, though, meant that, at least for the time being, the load on Jenny the pack mule would be increased as supplies from the two snake-bitten horses were loaded upon her and Captain Roberts mounted a younger mule. Snake bites and alternate mounts aside, though, the rangers were now making their most earnest attempt yet to hunt down the horse thieves whom they had already pursued so far over such rough country. After another day's brutal ride, the party had covered another estimated 60 miles. They again made a cold camp and rising early the next morning were back on the trail. That afternoon, they came upon the most promising sign yet that they were gaining ground on the raiding party. The carcasses of a large brown mare and a stocky sorrel mustang were discovered next to a fallen oak tree having been shot dead with a 50 caliber buffalo gun and denuded of their rib meat by the hungry raiding party. Until now, the captain had estimated the rangers' chances of catching the raiding party as one out of ten. Now, the captain cheerfully estimated to his men that they had as much as 95 chances out of 100 of catching their quarry. He insisted that the raiding party would not travel much farther before stopping to cook their newly begotten horse meat. Captain Roberts informed his men several among whom included rookie rangers like Jim Gillette, for whom this would be their first taste of real combat, that they would likely meet the raiding party tomorrow in a fight. A mixture of excitement tinged with cold terror spread amongst them, as the trial by fire they had so long desired was now at hand. In his memoirs, Gillette makes no small matter in marveling at the captain's self-assuredness in his knowledge of the country and of the habits of the raiding party. The rangers continued their pursuit, following the trail west to the South Concho River, then northwest out under the vast expanses of the mesquite-strewn Central Texas Plains. After another 50 miles of travel, another cold camp, and another hungry, restless night, the rangers checked their weapons in the pre-dawn light, tightened the cinches on their saddles, and loaded Jenny the pack mule with all the extra supplies they could not carry individually. They traveled another five or six miles before Ranger Paul Durham alerted Captain Roberts to a dark object on the horizon that looked as though it were moving. The captain brought it into focus with his field glasses and ordered his men to make ready, for he had spotted the native raiding party. The rangers were ordered to dismount and form a line. As they did this, what would be recalled by Jim Gillette as a distressing silence overtook the group. Captain Roberts and a sergeant named Hawkins were the only ones amongst them that had any actual real combat time against native forces, and as the tribal identity of their adversaries was yet unclear, they were all the more unnerved. Gillette recalls, Captain Roberts called out to us in positive tones not to leave until he told us to go, and not to draw a gun or a pistol until ordered, declaring that he wanted no mistake on the eve of battle. Roberts also ordered Jenny the pack mule to be turned loose when they went into the fight. Then, the party mounted, formed into a double file line, and began their advance on the still oblivious raiding party. The party moved in silence until within four to five hundred yards of the native raiders, who were still busy cooking and eating the horse meat they had harvested the day before. However, once they were spotted, the fight was on. Gillette's personal account is as follows. At once there was a terrible commotion. The Indians rounded up their stock and caught fresh mounts almost in the twinkling of an eye. Then, led by their old chief, they took positions on a little elevated ground some 200 yards beyond the loose horses. The Redskins stationed themselves about 15 or 20 feet apart, their battle line when being formed about 100 yards wide. As each warrior took his station, he dismounted, stood behind his horse, and prepared to fire when given the signal. Gillette recalls the surreal juxtaposition of his very real terror at his first taste of combat, and his fascination with his commanding officer's not only lack of fear, but sense of admiration for the enemy they were about to engage. Boys, they are going to fight us, he said. See how beautifully the old chief forms up his battle line? However, all belligerents present were quickly snapped back to reality by the very real and very immediate demands of battle. Now, within 100 yards of the raiding party, 
the captain ordered his men to dismount, to shoot low, and to kill any horse bearing a native rider that they could. Any native they could get on foot in this open and austere country, the captain believed they could overtake and kill or capture. Within seconds of this, the parties were engaged. And, as Gillette recalls, with the first shot, everybody, Indian and Ranger, began firing and yelling. Within the first minute of fighting, the Rangers had killed two horses and mortally wounded one native. In quick succession, the natives mounted their horses and attempted to make an escape, and the Rangers gave chase. Initially, Gillette's horse, himself facing the trials of combat for the first time, was spooked by the gunfire, and instead of following the rest of the Rangers, ran in several tight circles before finally coming under control. Gillette spotted a native warrior on foot, running for the cover of a mesquite thicket with a Winchester rifle in his hand. Before reaching the thicket, though, he managed to flag down a fellow warrior who swooped him up on the back of his horse behind his perch as rider. The native warrior's pony, now doubly burdened with an additional rider, made a mad dash under its rider's directive toward another thicket of mesquite, but Gillette's now focused and obedient mount was able to rapidly close the ground between them. As Gillette neared the pair, the passenger attempted several pot shots in an attempt to dissuade his pursuit, before ultimately holding the rifle out at arm's length and dropping it in an attempt to entice the ranger out of the chase in hopes of garnering himself a valuable firearm. Gillette and his mount remained undeterred, however, and they followed the native warriors and their mount into the mesquite thicket. After drawing up to within what the ranger estimated to be 20 paces of the pair, the overly excited young man hopped off of his horse and made a pot shot of his own at the natives. This, unfortunately, struck and killed their mount, with the horse falling onto the rider and the passenger managing to land on his feet and abscond into the bush. Seeing the rider pinned and thus less of an immediate threat, Gillette continued his pursuit for the passenger, but not before noting to himself, with no small degree of astonishment, that the rider seemed to be, in fact, a teenage white boy with long red hair who had evidently been assimilated into the tribe. This would not have been unheard of, but it was still quite the shock for the young ranger, one he had no time to fully digest while on the new trail of his more immediate quarry. He was joined by fellow ranger Ed Syker, who had seen the fleeing warrior from the other side of the thicket and joined Gillette in pursuit. Gillette had made another attempt at shooting the chief, but was unsuccessful as he ducked behind a mesquite tree limb. Syker, however, did not miss in his attempt at a follow-up shot and struck the warrior with a shot in the back killing him within a minute. When Syker and Gillette momentarily examined his body afterwards, it was determined from his leckings and bow style that he and his cohorts were members of the Lipan Apache tribe. The Lipan Apache are part of a group of Apache who had moved south from Canada between the years of 1000 to 1400 AD. These groups eventually subdivided into the Navajo, the Muscularo Apache, the Chiricahua Apache, the Hikaria Apache, and the Lipan Apache. They occupied the furthest, southeastern corners of the Apache lands. These particular Lipan Apaches were the Plains Lipan, whose homelands were these rugged expanses between the Colorado and the Concho Rivers in Texas. For centuries by this point, they had been warring with the Comanche. The conflict had seen them continually driven south and oftentimes fighting a two-front war against Anglo and Mexican settlers on one side and Comanche raiders on the other. In the preceding months, they had been relatively quiet, but the promise of this easy acquisition of a large amount of horses was simply too enticing to pass up for the Lipan in these hard times, and these times that were proving to be, even by the harsh standards of the frontier, exceedingly lean. They had, too, long made a habit of absconding with the children of both Mexican and Texan settlers. Too many times to count, a settler family on the Texas frontier saw their beloved children disappear in the blink of an eye gone forever at the hands of the Lipan, the Apache, or Comanche raiders. This did not, however, fully explain the red-headed rider of the fallen pony. Who was he? How did he come to be here, and was his family aware of his fate? All these questions swirled through the rangers' minds as they made their way back to the location of the fallen horse. But when Syker and Gillette arrived, they found only the unfortunate mount the mysterious redhead rider having freed himself and disappeared into the Texas landscape. And while none of the rookie rangers had been killed nor seriously injured, and their experienced commanders had emerged unscathed, 
one of the most experienced members of the ranger contingent, had not survived the day. Though she would not be found until months later, Ginny the pack mule had been struck with a single bullet just below the ear, instantly ending her earthly existence, as well as her legendary tenure with the rangers. Such a loss was felt heavily by the men, so heavily that Gillette devotes a sizable portion of his account to lamenting her untimely loss. All they could do now was make their way with the rest of the rangers under the command of Captain Roberts back to Menardville. To be sure, they were returning with the recovered horses, but to Gillette's inexperienced mind, they were seemingly more questions than answers after his first brush with mortality. Who was the red-headed boy? How had he ended up with the Lipan Apache, and where had he disappeared to? It would not be until many years later Gillette would learn the identity of the young red-headed warrior. His name was Adolf Korn, and he had been kidnapped years earlier by the Lipan Apache from his family home near present-day Fredericksburg, Texas. Adolf had fully assimilated into the Lipan Apache and was only eventually brought home much to his chagrin. However, he and Gillette would meet decades later and even maintain a friendship for a number of years until Korn's death in 1900. Gillette would continue his service with the Rangers for six more years until ultimately retiring in 1881. He would ultimately pass away in 1937 in Temple, Texas from a heart attack. His legend, the legend of Adolf Korn, and the all too often unsung story of the Lipan Apache are all topics that deserve their own episodes. And rest assured, those episodes are coming. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. Thank you for tuning into this episode of History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to click like, share, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and if you'd like to support our work, you can now find us on Patreon, link in the description below. Don't forget to check your boots for snakes. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time here on History at the OK Corral, history too real for the Westerns. <laughs>